There has rarely been a story on earth like that of the Arabian horse. From the first sighting, its beauty captivated man, its power and speed enthralled him. When God wished to create the horse, said the ancient Bedouin legend, he told the south wind, I shall create from thee a new being, and I shall make him good fortune for my followers, humiliation for my enemies, and protection for the obedient. God condensed wind and made from it a horse. Then God said, I name thee horse, and I make thee Arabian. I make thee to fly without wings. The Middle East was indeed the cradle of civilization, an agricultural and desert cradle that gave birth to the invention of writing at the hand of the Sumerians, built the first cities, invented the wheel, then created systems of monarchies, law, mathematics, and the calendar. And from this region emerged some of the earliest horses and horsemen. Man's fascination turned to skill in a partnership that would change all of history, first harnessing the horse. Ancient legend has it that the Arabian horse, the spirit of the desert, was God's gift to Ishmael as a reward for his faithfulness. He told Ishmael to go to the mountain and call for his gift. When Ishmael called, all the Arabians ran to his side and he was the first to ride them. And it was in the heart of the Middle East, Syria, Turkey, then the Arabian Peninsula, vast areas of desert, the nomadic Bedouin tribes roamed, that the true Arabian horse was to evolve. A horse that could withstand searing heat, go for long periods without water, a horse of extreme intelligence and beauty, and a preternatural attachment to humans. The land, often too arid to support pastures for a horse, bonded the Bedouin and their horses ever more closely. The horses relied upon them for their food. The Bedouin, in view of pastures, fed them camel's milk and dates. They kept them by their tents. Their children played with the foals. From the earliest times, there has been a profound, almost mystical attachment between these people and the horse. The Bedouins kept strict pedigrees of their horses through oral traditions. An owner could recite the history of every horse in his herd by memory. Their expertise as horsemen was extraordinary, and they trained their children from their earliest years. The horse became the very heart of Bedouin folklore and Bedouin life until the Bedouins and the Arabian horse became synonymous.
One historian, al Akhlusi, wrote, In an ancient world, the horse was at the heart of life, security, a man's most valued possession. Horses to the Arabs were the most significant things in life. They were the symbol of their erected fortresses, their everlasting treasures, their finest glories. The Arabs, he noted, excelled in their knowledge about these animals more than all other nations. As riders, they dazzled the world. Chariots grew ever sleeker, the riders more skilled, the horses more refined. The horse, chariot, and composite bow in Egypt carried the pharaohs as commanders to glory. While the Assyrians assembled and conquered with the first cavalry in the Near East, a team of man and horse the speed, the power, the skill that led to empires. great hunger and sees a great distance. He is a very great drinker of the Arabic wind. He is the terror of the enemy in battle. The warriors and their horses became so esteemed they were adorned with artisans' work so exquisite that they rivaled jewelry. Their victories, these warriors, the riders of the pre-Islamic empires became legend and created empires, the Assyrians, Egyptians, Hittites, Parthians, Sassanids. They would ultimately become the vehicle that spread the word and conquests of a new religion from Arabia, Islam. Across deserts and continents, the Prophet Muhammad's followers, first from Mecca and then the entire Middle East, charged forward with it to two-thirds of the known world. Really and truly, the horse for uh... 4,750 years. Uh, it is the most important, uh, dominant uh, sort of uh, force in everything, in people's life, in agriculture, in wars, in, in victories. And Saudi Arabia is the heart of, of the Arabian Peninsula, and that's where the Arabian uh, horse started. Uh, to me, what really glorified and emphasized the, uh, the role and the importance of the horse is, is our holy book. In that uh, aspect, I think there is a whole surah that talks about the horse. It's, it's called Surah al adiyat And that tells you how important, if it is part of even the belief, to glorify this, I mean, creature. The Holy Quran's words about these creatures that carried Islam to the ends of the earth are haunting. 
powerful. The steeds that run with panting breath and strike sparks of fire and push home the charge in the morning and raise dust into the clouds. As they spread empires, these extraordinary horses scattered across continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, the Islamic conquests in the 7th century and onward through the expansion of the Ottoman Empire from the 15th century and on. And each step seemed to follow the next, entering Spain with Islamic conquests, where conquests didn't take the Arabian horse, traders did. Columbus, in search of new trade routes to India, took horses with Arabian blood to the Americas. The Arabian traders who controlled the spice routes also sold their horses to India, to the Mediterranean coasts of Africa, Egypt, Word of the attributes of the Arabian horse became known, and Europeans sought to acquire them. They became gifts of sultans, prize of kings, and spread even farther as royalty sent the jewel of the desert to one another. In the late 1600s, they came to England as royal gifts, and with breeders who crossbred them with their own horses. The result was the thoroughbred, the most famous racehorse of today, all of whom trace back to three original Arabian sires. More gift Arabians followed, from the Sultan of Turkey, ruler of Muscat. Queen Victoria received them from heads of state in India, Egypt, Turkey, as did many of the kings and queens of Europe. Many that weren't given as gifts were captured in war. The famous stallion Marengo was captured by Napoleon in Egypt. In 1815, the British then captured Marengo at the Battle of Waterloo. So famous was this stallion's prowess that when he died at the age of 38, his skeleton was held on display at the Royal Service Museum. They spread across Europe as kings, queens, czars sought them for their beauty and ability and began to crossbreed them with their own horses. The stunning legacy of this was the creation of what is now every light horse breed in existence that is prized by horsemen. As the Arabians moved across Europe, the famous European stud farms were created in Hungary, Poland, Spain, Russia, The military in these countries eagerly sought them for their extreme intelligence and agility in battle and use of Arabian blood became very significant in the development of light cavalry in Europe. But times through the 1800s were becoming lean in the Middle East. Endless warfare had taken its toll. Poverty was now a constant. In a strange twist of fate, the Arabian horse's new fame abroad was ultimately to be its savior through these harsh times. By the 1800s, the single largest stronghold of Arabian horse remained in Egypt. Beginning in the early 1700s, Egypt's rulers sent his scouts into the desert to acquire the most beautiful horses from the Bedouin tribes. This tradition continued on through his son and grandson, Abbas Pasha, whom he put in charge of running the breeding program. Abbas Pasha scoured the deserts of Arabia, and he was particularly entranced by those bred by the Al Saud in what is now Saudi Arabia. These he brought back to Egypt in hopes of maintaining the exquisite bloodlines of his grandfather's Arabians. He spent a million pounds to create three different studs, and at one of the farms had 300 camels to produce milk for the foals according to the Bedouin tradition. He ultimately created one of the most famous collections of Arabians ever. Abbas Pasha's passion 
ultimately became the source and the savior for much of the bloodstock, both the horses and the history of their bloodline. <laughs> The situation in the Middle East had continued to disintegrate. Hard times had become devastating times. The Ottoman Empire, which had held sway over most of the region, had begun to collapse, leaving poverty and chaos behind. The people suffered, the horses suffered, their numbers dwindled. Many of the famed Arab breeders could no longer afford to breed them or to keep them. Into this sad episode came some travelers, some adventurers who would prove the unlikely rescuers of this noble breed, Europeans then Americans, who had been fascinated by their beauty and ability traveled into the deserts of Arabia to seek bloodstock. The expeditions of the people themselves were extraordinary stories. In 1873, Lady Anne Blunt of England, the Baroness of Wentworth, and her husband began their travels through the Middle East to seek out Arabian horses to bring back to England, buying them from the Bedouin tribes and from Ali Pasha Sharif in Egypt. They returned to their crabbed stud in England with desert horses whose names have become legend in the annals of Arabians. Masamud, Rodania, Azraq, Queen of Sheba, Dajania. They began to breed these horses and sell them throughout the world. Australia, Africa, India, Europe. The legacy of this single endeavor was astonishing. Today, the majority of Arabian horses worldwide have descended from the lines of Lady Anne Blunt's Kravitz stud. In the United States, over 90% of all registered Arabians trace back to Lady Anne and Kravitz. Detecting a possible interest in the broader U.S., the Turks sent some Arabians to the World Fair of 1893. Prior to that, the few Arabians in the U.S. had been used to improve other breeds such as racing stock, the American saddlebred, the Tennessee walking horse. But the public in general was not familiar with purebred Arabians. Turks ran out of money by the time the horses were to come home and had to leave them behind, creating another fortuitous diaspora for the Arabians. Poor though the Turks may be, their horses had thrilled the Americans. One of those was Homer Davenport, the famous political cartoonist for the Hearst newspapers. As a boy, his father had read stories to him about the Bedouin and their spectacular horses. Davenport saw his first in person at the World Fair. In 1905, Homer Davenport contacted President Theodore Roosevelt, a rider and horse lover himself. Davenport explained the beauty of the horses and said that he wished to travel to Turkey, which had never previously agreed to sell its precious Arabian mares to bring them back to America. President Roosevelt was fascinated. Davenport left for Turkey to acquire horses from the Sultan, then on into Syria and beyond. Wild adventure followed wild adventure. In the end, Homer Davenport returned to America, bringing the Arabian horses of his quest, the first mass importation of Arabian horses 
to the U.S. The handful of early wealthy breeders in the U.S., Spencer Borden, W.K. Kellogg, Roger Selby, W.R. Brown, Daisy Tankersley, were captivated by their beauty and acquired the Arabian horses who came via Davenport, the Turks, the Kravitz stud. And the Americans came far and wide to see them. Their fascination combined with the next unlikely turn of history would turn the U.S. into the world's largest breeder of Arabians, and then the Arabian Peninsula back to center stage in its life. History began an extraordinary swing of the pendulum that none had foreseen. In the very heart of its homeland, the last horseman captured the kingdom of Saudi Arabia on horseback, Abdulaziz. I call it the story of the last horseman. You know, King Abdulaziz united this country on horseback. And uh, the last uh, leg of, of, of his unification of Saudi Arabia was on a horseback, uh, the Battle of Jeddah. King Abdulaziz united the desert tribes into Saudi Arabia and then decided to let an American oil company in to explore. They discovered oil, and to the excitement of the horsemen in that group, the Arabian horse. <laughs> Judy and Don Forbes came with the oil company and began sending Arabians back home to their Ansata stud and the huge wave of interest in America it created. Well, uh, we were married in Turkey and I'd always loved Arabian horses. I loved horses, cut my teeth on the black stallion like so many other young people. And uh, when we married, we became very interested in, in racing Arabians, and we lived in the southeast part of Turkey. And from there, we proceeded to decide that we'd like to raise Arabians just for fun in the state someday. When we went to Cairo, and uh, we went to the, to the breeding farm, the El Zara, at the Egyptian Agricultural Organization, the minute we drove onto the farm, we knew that we had found the, the mecca of the Arabian horse, so to speak. And these were the horses that had been preserved from the days of Abbas Pasha, relatively unspoiled or unchanged through other introduction of other Arabian bloodlines. There was a stallion there called Nazir, and he was one of these great, probably one of the greatest breeding horses of the 20th century. And so we chose three of his yearlings and uh, brought them to the States. And it, it started a, a brand new a renaissance for the Egyptian Arabian horse in America. The Arabian horse headed west, and then farther west, no longer just for the few wealthy breeders, but to the thrill of ranches. West fell in love, and before long, those Arabian horses could do anything John Wayne ever had had in mind. The horsemen in the U.S. began to breed them, welcoming each birth with excitement. Mr. Ellis, uh, I understand you have nothing but Arab horses here, is that right? That's right, because I consider them the most beautiful of all, and beside being beautiful, they're wonderful work horses if they get a chance to show what they can do, like in Colorado, especially one big ranch, they use them all together for stock horses. Uh -huh. I and see. they can do anything any other horse can do. While the Arabian horse was captivating the West, oil was returning the wealth to Arabia. With it, 
the rebirth of one of the deepest parts of its culture. Reading, writing, training, Arabian voices with Saudi Arabia at its center. King Abdullah became determined to bring back the horses and Saudi Arabia has returned at the head of a renaissance of purebred Arabian breeding in the Near East. Today, some of the most beautiful in the world are at King Abdullah's farm, Al Janadriya. A gift from Prince Khalid. He was a triple crown winner in 1998, um, triple crown winner, European champion, world champion, uh, and Aachen All Nations Cup champion. Uh, this is um, Quranic. Um, in 2004, he was crowned the most winningest horse ever. Um, it's a stallion, he's a leading sire uh, on the farm. Um, very charismatic stallion and um, first in the nationals this, uh, in 2008, um, sired by a, a chronic son, so he's a chronic grandson, the, the grey stallion we saw earlier. Um, and uh, that's all he's been shown, he hasn't been shown that much because he's homebred. So. He's a character, he likes himself too. <laughs> you were talking about, in general, the breeding program here. Yeah, our breeding program, we have about uh, 400 Arabians on the farm and we breed certainly, uh, you know, many of the horses are bred for showing, but we have a very active breeding program for the desert breads. We're very, very keen to try and produce quality horses and I keep emphasizing the point, horses that have confirmation and horses that have function. <laughs> So we are showing you two horses. One is the classical desert bred, which is a strong, robust horse with generally excellent conformation, excellent temperament. And overall, you know, just, I would say, what would be typical of the Arabian horse. Over the past century, the Arabian horse has become quite modified for its looks. And we are trying to find a fine balance between the looks for showing and the functionality of the Arabian horse as per the tradition. And, and how do you, how would you describe modified over time? I would say that, uh, you know, I'm a vet by profession and we look very carefully at confirmation. And uh, I think, you know, that personally I would have a, I feel that, you know, you can have horses that have, that are perfect for showing, but don't have the confirmation for what I would call functionality. So we want to make sure that as we are breeding the horses, we're breeding the horses with good bone, good confirmation and good feet. And that would be the basis of your Arabian horse, because the typical uh, desert bred here, and you know, they have very refined features, but they probably don't have the degree of refinement that's possibly required for showing. But they are fantastic horses. To ride. To ride, and you know, for, for every purpose, you know, they have got beautiful action. And uh, this is the tradition. This is, these are horses that can trace their lineage back, you know, 10, 12 generations, most of them back to the time of King Abdullah Aziz. And these are the lines that King Abdullah has maintained. These would be what you would choose for the new cavalry today. Yes, without a doubt. Yeah, well, we have, we have an American trainer, and he talks about it. He's one of our thoroughbred trainers, and he talks about horses, and he said that in the Wild West, if you robbed a bank and you were trying to make a getaway, what type of horse would you want to make a getaway on? And if you were to look at some beautiful show horse or a solid, robust-looking desert bread, you'd go for the desert bread because that would bring you miles across the desert. You'd be out of Dodge, <laughs> right? You'd be out of Dodge, yeah. What makes this horse particularly special? Um, basically, it's his charisma, his attitude to, to want to express himself in, in the correct manner with his tail over his back and his, his nostrils flared. And it, it does the, the, his motion is absolutely superb. His attitude is, is spot on. But overall, he's got a good face, good size eye, lovely shape to his neck and a, and a very level, a level back. His back is very level. Start with um, this is a this is a desert bred um, a stallion, um, so totally different origins from the first colt, uh, and a totally different type. This is more what you'd see in the desert, about more of a type you'd see about two or three hundred years ago in the desert. The shorter um, shorter legs, uh, more correct conformation, a stronger type, more suitable for, for riding than the previous type, 
and totally different qualities. But in himself, he's very charismatic when he's showing off, and uh, he loves to carry his tail, but a, a very different type to the, the previous one. And you were a terrific show-off, I know. I know you kind of like yeah, that. Showing off fun. one minute and then quiet, quiet as yeah, much the next minute. That's kind of fun. At the King Abdulaziz Horse Center near Riyadh, reading the perfect Arabian is a key focus. King Abdelaziz Arabian Horse Center provide a lot of services to the breeders in Saudi Arabia uh, for their Arabian horses. Uh, we do all the trust for Arabians according to the rules and regulations of the World Arabian Horse Organization, WAHO. The horse born, they should do the blood type and or DNA to make the qualification for the pedigree that it's related back to this stallion and this mare. This is the first point to trust that this is a pure Arabian horse. And, and we uh, send all the document from the registry in Saudi Arabia to any registry in the world for the export horses. I think Wadim Ben Sharkasu, he was the uh, winner of the most beautiful head in the world in the championship in Qatar. Uh, he is uh, very quiet and very good for breeding. He has an ego because he's beautiful. <laughs> Breeding of the Arabian, the desert breed Arabian horses, uh, it's, there is a big difference between them and the Arabian Polish and Arabian Russian, where they have a beautiful movement. Pure Arabian desert breed horses, they born in Saudi Arabia, they are uh, a special breed line uh, related to the desert of Saudi Arabia, and we are trying to, to, uh, to improve a lot of things in the breeding of this kind of horses. And you cannot see the improvement in Arabian horses within one generation or within four, four years, five years. At least you need 20 years to see how they improved. Going back to desert red also heightened the search for lineage. The record of bloodlines for all of the Arabians. It led King Abdullah along with historians on a worldwide search for the single greatest missing record on them. The, the desert is more of verbal. They don't write. So the starting of uh, uh, writing uh, the history of the horse, I think that is when, it's, I mean, what started the development. When Abbas Basa sent to Imam Faisal bin Turki and told him, I want the name and the pedigree. And he said, well, we are Bedouins. He sent some people. So he sent some people. And they start writing. He sent them to the tribes because he presented him with some horses. When he sent those bashas from Egypt, they start writing from where? This is Hamdani, this is Saglawi, this is... And then that was the start of writing the pedigree. This is, and that's almost 175 years, handsome, or 150 years. The Abbas Basha manuscript is a very important manuscript. I think it's, for us, it is the rarest, the rarest uh, manuscript we ever get in this library. Uh, related to horses. It was unique. And I was a devotee of Lady Anne Blunt, and of course in her books uh, she mentions this Abbas Pasha manuscript, and so did Prince Muhammad Ali in, in two of his books. So I thought, well, somewhere in Egypt that manuscript still has to exist, and I kind of put that in my the back of my head. As someday I would find that. And when my husband and I moved to Egypt in 1967. We were also good friends, became good friends with uh, the family of descendants of Ali Pasha Sharif. Uh, so I asked um, Mr. Sharif, well, is there any chance that you might have this book? And he said, well, he didn't think so, but after a period of time, we kept talking about it. And he said, well, you know, there's an old book down in the basement that he brought it up and uh, we sat down and looked at it. And then after a short period of time, I we figured it out. This was the long lost manuscript. As the Arabian horse dispersed through Europe, 
England onto the United States, it truly became an international citizen with characteristics developed in these different locations. Saudi Arabia never been in uh, having an international uh, competition. So uh, four years ago, it disturbed me. Saudi Arabia is the the base and the 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 the, 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 the land for the horses, the Arabian horses. We should have it. Not only we should have it, we should have the best competition. So that's how it comes, uh, not only a competition for beauty contest, I made sure that it become like a festival for, uh, for the Arabian horses and all the lovers of Arabian horses can, can gather around uh, from all over the world. Uh, it has, uh, plus it has an endurance uh, competition and uh, a race uh, competition. And hopefully in the future, uh, we, I'm still thinking about it, but to have a special jumping uh, competition. And I would say that really good Arabian is a good Arabian wherever it comes from. Uh, there is a trend for American bred horses, because um, the US is selling quite a lot of horses, and, uh, both in the Middle East and in Europe. So that means a very refined uh, type. But this being said, I mean, there's a place for every type as long as it's good. So. Well, how would you describe the American type horse? I would say it's a, it's a show horse, above all. I would say it's a horse that's uh, there to be, to be admired by the public. So he's got swoonlingly beautiful lines, I'd say very long neck, uh, very pretty head, I would say. Maybe in the stallion division, the American stallions are slightly more feminine than they would be, than they would be in Poland or in Europe generally. Uh, they're really show horses. In Europe, there's a trend more to breeding horses. They're looking more for correctness of stallion. They still have to be good. In Europe, they emphasize more the movement. And in America, for the time being, you emphasize more the stand-up of the horse. It has to look beautiful when it's stood up. And in Europe, it has to be both beautiful when it's stood, but it also when it moves. How about the Middle East? Middle East, a little bit of a mix. They mix they, they're following the American trend, but also they're very attentive to Europe, and they, they participate in all the major European shows, so they, uh, they really want to win in Europe. Championship can mean a big price tag. Well, 30,000. <laughs> and a ticket anywhere in the world for the Arabian horse who may have become the world's most international citizen, the frequent flyer of all time. This, this name is Umar Shadina. This is uh, more than two years in the Khalidia. This is uh, Menden 2006 uh, World Champion. And Om El means it was bred by Om El Arab International, correct? International, yes. Okay. And that is owned by you, Sigi Constante, and is in Santa Inez, California. Correct. So this horse, in other words, was born in California and is now in Saudi Arabia at Al Halidiyah. Right. And Shadina is a beautiful example of our breeding program because she is a very tall, gorgeous Arabian mare and she has produced beautiful babies too. We sell horses all over the world. We have sold horses to Saudi Arabia, to almost every country in Europe, to South Africa, to Brazil. Um, I think there's no country left we haven't exported to. <laughs> the Arabian horses combining 
all countries and all cultures and people have been interchanging bloodlines for many years. My mom, when she was in her early 20s, this is 40 years ago, uh, went to Spain and bought her foundation mare, Estopa. She actually was named a century mare. She's very famous. Um, and she went to Egypt and bought a stallion named Chakra El Masri. And what she did was she combined the strong Spanish horses, which they're heavier workhorses, um, with the lighter, more refined Egyptian horse. And it was really, it's done often now, but at that time it was revolutionary. And um, they were actually, these young students my parents were, and they were scoffed at by the establishment for doing this. Um, but what they did is they developed this horse, much like, much like this, like, like this, that are refined, big, athletic horses that can do anything, um, but are beautiful to look at. And they excel in the show ring because they have sort of an airy, charismatic way about them. As the breeding intensifies, so too does the focus on the different strains. Christy, what are the ideal attributes, the ideal features that you are breeding for? Of the horses that we concentrate on, originate, their bloodlines originated with those that were recorded by Abbas Pasha. As you see on Ali Saruk, we love the big, dark, liquid eye that really speaks uh, the tales say that it speaks of the soul of the horse. We like the nice close ears that have a little scorpion shape to them with a tipping in, but still set enough that they can hear well as you see his ears revolving. The beautiful big jowl and the nostrils set very high so they can catch wind. He is very upright and has beautiful fine skin and everything he has a lot of the attributes that we really like, and he's very classic in type. Very smooth bone, he's tall, has great tail carriage, and a wonderful presence and a very good mind. Scottsdale, Arizona calls Dubai. London calls Muscat as the horses go all over the world and the competitions become ever more important, not just for beauty, but for their ability also as athletes, as the Arabians have surged onto the racetrack, the endurance field, and hunter-jumper competitions. The Arabians' versatility seems limitless, a horse that you can do everything with. desert form, the endurance races dazzle. The ability of the rider and the horse intertwined over miles of desert. Well, I think <coughs> endurance riding is a, is a part of our culture. And I think it's a sport where you need to concentrate, you need to calculate, and you need to uh, be more patient in practicing this kind of sport where I think all these things are a part of the Arabian horse uh, by nature. You need to, to help your horse in order for your horse to help you and to, uh, to achieve a, a good results in these races. It's a sport no longer confined to men, but a signal of whole new eras in the Middle East. I started to do endurance when I was 16 years old. 
and I, I love endurance because I think it's a good chance to understand your horses and also it's apart from our religion and proud part of our uh, uh, tradition also. Um, from our family, uh, female from our family, they used to do horse riding. So I think it's a big responsibility for, for me to be a first female rider in Saudi Arabia. Say for, uh, for male, we shock them because I'm a, a, a girl and they, they shocked. But uh, I think they understand that we equal women and men. And uh, I feel I, I have a message to our generation uh, to, uh, to remind them uh, how it's great to ride horse and uh, to use to do this sport. The Arabian is equally spectacular all over the world as a jumper. I started in Rome when I was a young child at seven. And in the summer I used to ride, and in the winter where I was studying in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, I was riding just a little, little bit, and mostly Arabians. Then from that, you know, I took it further and started competing in shows. And you know, uh, when you start, it's difficult, but you don't give up when you find the first obstacle. You just find ways around it, right. and then you take it to the next step. That's it. And you have to juggle. That's life, you know. And, and you things have on. changed a lot. And things since have you changed a lot tremendously uh, during the, these last 18 years. Um, you, we have women now competing. We have women in endurance. We have uh, girls show jumping. And the number is uh, tremendously increased. The origin of horsemanship is from the Arabian Peninsula, and the best and most sought-after varieties of horses are the pure Arabian. You shouldn't be surprised that there is a great interest and that many owners are present in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and of course, their horses. In and outside of the Kingdom, and always, the Arabian horse is distinguished in its form, its stock, and its beauty. The Saudis are a people who love horsemanship in a general sense, and there is now encouragement and development in the sponsorship of and interest in equestrianism. And with our coming projects, riders may take an interest in horsemanship from their youth. The Saudi Equestrian Federation began a number of years ago, but it is not very old. Nevertheless, the achievements during these years have instilled a great hope. We are very proud of our accomplishments in Sydney in terms of medals, and we also obtained advanced positions in Peking in the last Olympics. I like riding, and I feel I'm flying when I ride. Halfway around the world, the West is turning out performers in dressage, jumping, Western pleasure, and working cow horses. country comes with me. Lord, I come from the country, and the country comes with me. I can plow in the springtime, I can shake your lemon tree. It's a long, lonesome journey to the land that I Do they have the physical versatility to do a number of different things, dressage, hunter-jumper, western pleasure, you know. Well, what's, what's happening now in the modern show horse world and breeding world, actually, is people are breeding specific, even though they're still Arabians, they're breeding for specific disciplines. English trainers are breeding for high trotting, long high necks, good-minded horses. Western trainers are breeding for a more substantial horse that's quiet and, and easy and very pretty. Um, and so what we've found, and the same thing for dressage, people are breeding for Arabian dressage horses now, for Arabian cutting horses and, and working Western horses. There are different looking Arabians. All those Arabians no longer look the same. So it's no longer the versatile Arabian that it was 30 years ago where the one horse did all these different divisions. Um, it actually takes different types of horses to really excel in the extreme dis opposites, like Western versus English, the saddle seat horses. 
it's it's exciting because those those breeds can now those horses can now go out and compete in the open world. The dressage Arabian horses that are really bred for that, they can go and, and compete in open dressage. Those horses can now go out and compete in the open world. The dressage Arabian horses that are really bred for that, they can go and, and compete in open dressage. The, open the working dressage Western, meaning they can compete against other breeds yes, successfully. Exactly, exactly. So they can do that in dressage and what else? In the open reining world, in the cutting horse world, in the, you know, whatever discipline you are. In my opinion, Arabians are very versatile overall. You just have to choose the one that's, that's suited for what you want to do. The Arabian jumping divisions have grown tenfold since I started doing it. In this country alone, the horse show in Scottsdale had huge number of entries in every jumping class this year. In the United States, a good jumping Arab is hard to beat uh, foot speed alone. What makes them a good jumper is basically their heart. And if you never show them what they can't do and they think they can do it, they have the heart of a lion and they'll try anything for you. You could have trained any horse you wanted to, and you decided on a career training Arabians. Why? Um, I had horses when I was born. My sister had a horse, just a grade horse, and I rode whatever I could ride till I was 10 years old, and my parents got me my first Arabian. And the difference that I, the biggest difference I noticed is that they wanted to be with me, their interaction with people, and how, you know, how the Bedouins used to keep them in their tents, and, and they were part of the family. They're really wonderful to train, and they're very interactive horses with people. I like that responsiveness, I like the connection. It's a much better connection for me with an Arabian than it was for the other horses that I rode. The Arabian horse has not only become a matter of huge trade worldwide, it has become a bridge between cultures. We feel the horses is part of the peace messenger between the people all over the world. A peace messenger? Yes, because it's a hobby. What we like here, the other people, they like it. So it crosses international it cross, yes. boundaries. Yeah. It's above politics. There is politics. no nationality, no uh, whatever. All of us, everywhere, we love and we like those horses. So when I go to Europe or to the state or to Asia, I enjoy racing over there as I enjoy it here. And we have much one hobby between us and other people and everywhere, all the continent. So it's, a, as I said, it's a peace, food, a peace message. I see that in the present day, horses and horsemanship have become, in a general sense, have become very important and are among the distinguished factors that can play a great role in peace. Thus, and very much so, equestrianism can constitute a message of peace. And so the Arabian horse, having gone on one of the most remarkable odysseys in all of history, has become not only the ultimate international citizen, but a bond spanning all points and all peoples of the globe. I make thee to fly without wings.